My name is Anne-Marie Codor, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to be presenting with my friends and colleagues, Professor Mary Elizabeth King and Alcia Middleton Detzner, on the topic of gender and civil resistance. <coughs> so I will start with a historical review of um, some of the the struggles and movements where women have been involved and what kind of lessons we can learn. Is this okay with the mic? You, yeah. you hear me? Okay. And then Marie will uh, look at, uh, more specifically at the civil rights movement and will tell you how it was predominantly organized and led by women, even though their role has be often been downplayed in the way the history of this mo movement has been written. And then Alcia will ask more questions about how the field of gender theory can illuminate some of the questions we have in the field of civil <coughs> resistance. So I would like to start with this point that history, if you look at history textbooks, there are two blind spots that you find. You don't really find many women. It's if, if history was a play of theater, it's as if men were taking center stage, doing all kinds of wars and other violent uh, pursuits, and women are kind of in the background or having secondary roles. And the second blind spot is that, as you know, acts of nonviolent civil resistance have been very much unreported and neglected by historians. And there's probably a, a connection, a very strong connection between these two, because according to um, feminist sociologist Pam McAllister, most of what we commonly call women's history is actually the history of women's role in the development of nonviolent action. Which means that women have not been passive uh, spectators of history, obviously. They have been very much actors of change, but they have not used the same tools and the same weapons as men. They have used a lot of the tools of civil resistance and civil disobedience for two reasons, because women were excluded for ar from armies and from all institutionalized forms of political violence, and they were not trained in the military. But most import importantly, <coughs> when, when women have, uh, have been seeking ways of waging conflicts, they have had as their first priority to protect their children and families, so they looked for ways to engage in, in uh, um, conflicts that carry the lowest risks to be injured or killed, and this is the field of uh, civil resistance and civil disobedience. So you are now very familiar with uh, this representation of power uh, as a, almost a temple with all these big pillars of support, and we can actually look at um, those two structures of you know, power structure, political, social, economical, that have enshrined social, racial, political, economic in inequalities and injustices. And there is another one, they are actually overlap, which is patriarchy, which is also a, a system of power that enshrines gender inequalities. And so women had to face these two systems of power. I either they have been fighting for broader <coughs> rights without necessarily challenging patriarchy, or they've been fighting for their equal rights and without addressing necessarily other injustices and other broader rights. But increasingly, they're actually addressing the two at the same time. They are fighting the two at the same time. We're going to start with campaigns and movements where women have been fighting oppressive power and have been struggling in the name of their community, on behalf of their community, but without challenging patriarchy. So they have been actually using the traditional roles that were assigned to them. The case of uh, Las Madres de la Plaza de Mayo is well known in Argentina in the 1970s. The military junta had disappeared uh, hundreds, uh, thousands of young dissidents tortured and killed and their remains buried secretly. And on April 30th, 1977, a group of 14 women converged on Plaza de Mayo in the middle of Buenos Aires 
with pictures of their disappeared children and asking a very simple question, what happened to our children? And from that date on, every Thursday afternoon, mothers and grandmothers of the disappeared returned to the Plaza de Mayo in growing numbers to challenge the authorities. And here the regime faced a big dilemma because it could not openly repress these women. So it tried to intimidate them by disappearing several of their founding members. But despite those threats, they remained mobilized. Their movement grew more and more. And actually, this was a they had a catalyst role in mobilizing civil society against dictatorship. So yes, here we see a st uh, an example of a dilemma action where women are using their strategic advantage from using their traditional family values as mothers. In this kind of pa patriarchal dictatorial regime, those family values are a core pillar of support of the regime. So if the women challenge the authorities as mothers, as frail, fragile mothers just caring for their children, they actually are striking at the core uh, of the regime by pulling out uh, that core pillar of support, which delegitimizes the regime. Another example where women have been using their traditional roles in society is the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace. Liberia had been in a bloody civil war for 14 years and with hundreds of thousands of people killed. And at some point, the women said, we, we had enough. We cannot let our children be killed anymore. We cannot be raped anymore. They came together under the leadership of Leima Bowie in 2003. A coalition of Christian and Muslim women came together. They also reached out to the networks of market women. So they were both addressing the dictator, Charles Taylor, and the guerrilla warlords who were killing each other. And they, they sit, they, they organize sit-ins, all dressed in white for peace, in front of the presidential palace for days on, for months and months. And they also used some, uh, one of the tactics they used was sex, the sex strikes. And they put so much pressure on both sides that eventually they forced those men, those powerful men on both sides, to sit at the negotiating table. The negotiations took place in Ghana. The women of Liberia sent women to Accra to be able to be there, 600 of them surrounding the hotel where the negotiators were. And they did not let go until the men would sign um, a peace agreement. So this is an example where women have been able to accomplish something really unimaginable. And they just did that from the point of view of being just mothers, taking care of their community, asking for peace. So we also see in, this, in both of these examples that facing women regime have, have huge dilemma. They, they cannot, uh, they actually, the repression against women is, seems to be much less than against men. And there is a quantitative, I want to ask that question, women ac are women activists less repressed than men? Uh, for, to have a quantitative uh, sense of that, I just looked at the first six weeks of the Syrian revolution when it was absolutely non-violent. You know, people in the streets all over Syria from March, April 2011. And when you see the numbers of activists who were killed by the Assad regime, 843, 80, 27 of them were men, 16 women. So it's 2% two, two women, uh, where women was probably 20 or 30% of the, of the protesters. And even one year later, if you look at the number of the detainees, only 1.5% of the detainees were women. So there is definitely here a strategic advantage that women can have, especially when they come to the protest or what come to the, the movements in their traditional roles. They pose a much bigger dilemma. So now I want to look at other uh, cases of movements where women do not come as mothers or, you know, 
uh, good uh, take care take care carers of the of the of their communities, but they they are also challenging patriarchy. They are challenging uh, the the inequal. Uh, balanced structure of their societies. And the movement for women's rights, historically, they, they didn't come out of nowhere, they always came from other movements where women in, where got involved uh, to fight for broader rights, human rights, civil rights, or for regi regime change. And then from that, they started asking for their own rights. If we go back in time to the 19th century, in the United States, we see that from the movement of uh, the anti-slavery movement, abolitionist movement, women got uh, in uh, involved, both black women and, and white women w got involved together to work to free the slaves, especially, for instance, through the underground, underground railroad, which was the, sec the secret route from the south of the United States to the north where they would hide slaves that were escaping the South. So there was this network, incredible network of um, a lot of women involved in that. And from that experience, that incredible experience of working together, honing those skills of resistance, started the first movement for women's rights. One of these abolitionists, Lucy Stone, said, I expect to plead not for the slave only, but for suffering of humanity everywhere, especially do I mean to labor for the elevation of my sex. And they did that, they started that movement using civil disobedience. Susan Anthony said, the only chance women have for justice in this country is to violate the law, as I have done and as I shall continue to do. This was a decade-long movement, the suffragist movement, to ask for the right to vote. And that movement actually innovated several of the methods of nonviolent protest that were later on used by many different movements throughout the 20th century. The women, for instance, started a petition. They wanted to have one million signatures to ask for the, vote, the right of vote for women. They went door to door for years. They, they made big, um, marches for hundreds of miles. And that was like 30 years before Gandhi's Salt March. They started uh, in the first decade of the century doing that. And then in 1917, they came to New York City to deliver that million signatures <coughs> campaign. They also uh, did the first picket ever of the White House in front of the White House. Here, here are the silent sentinels. Those first uh, feminists, the leaders of that movement, were brutally repressed. Um, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns were put in jail. While, while they were in jail, they started a hunger strike. Um, they were force-fed and attached to their chairs, and they were threatened to be put in a, a mental asylum because the authorities look at them as crazy women, insane women. But the the news of that repression came out in the press and the backfire was enormous on the Congress. And eventually it turned, it turned the law and in 1920 the 19th Amendment was voted for the right to vote for women. So we see that, uh, I'm, I'm just, I just tried to show you like graphically a little bit the two waves that we have in the United States. The first wave that we talked about 70 years of movement to, to, uh, to produce that, break, that breakthrough in 1920. Then um, the, it, we have to wait until the late 50s and early 60s to have the second wave of uh, women's rights movement. And that, that wave was ignited by another movement, the civil rights movement. So, so from the civil rights movement, the involvement of women um, create that momentum to start uh, a, a, a new feminist movement and Mary will talk about um, that connection between the civil rights movement and the second uh, women's rights movement that produced all the, the laws that um, stopped the discrimination, the sex discrimination in this country. So hundreds of, of campaigns have been waged in all over the world <coughs> for the past 150 years. 
So it's not only the right to vote, it's the right, equal rights in family law, abolition of polygamy, criminalization of all forms of violence against women, honor killings, rape, sexual assaults, domestic violence, for economic rights and equal pay, for reproduc reproductive rights, very important, abortion, contraception, and for equal representation in all decision-making processes. So even here, we are still far from having done absolutely 100% everything, but we are very, very, very far already. We have, but some countries on the other uh, spectrum have not even started. We can say that um, Saudi Arabia, for instance, uh, hasn't even started in that list. So it's only through campaigns, very, very determined campaign that women um, have been able to gain those rights. And once women start um, developing these skills to start for, to ask for their equal rights, it has also a very beneficial effect on the rest of the movements, all the other movements for broader rights. <coughs> As we've seen in the case of um, the um, suffragist movement in the US, it created a lot of methods that were then that have inspired and fostered other movements. Same thing here in all, uh, <coughs> in all other countries. And Sherin Ebadi, who is a um, human rights lawyer, Nobel Peace Laureate, uh, said, a victory for women paves the way for democracy in Iran. So here is the Iranian women's movement of 2006-2009 that asked for um, uh, <coughs> ma many of the things that we, we had in the other slide, the, the end of uh, unjust uh, inheritance um, system, etc., etc. They used dilemma actions, they unified people, they went into the ur um, urban women and, and rural women worked together, they, they built capacity building at the international level, they used non-cooperation and symbols and songs and they were very skilled at using digital media as well and created a lot of dilemma actions. Um, even though, I mean, they had a very, very uh, small victories in, in terms of immediate victories, um, actually, but there, the, that movement created the, the momentum to, to um, the mobilization of the civil society in 2009 with the Green Wave, which itself, as we said to, uh, earlier, it failed, quote unquote failed, but not, not everything is lost of these movements. They, are, um, they have taught many lessons to activists in those, in those countries, and you can hope that in the next wave uh, there will be more success. <coughs> so there is this reinforcing feedback loop where their involvement for broader rights uh, teach women to be more empowered to ask for their own rights, their women's rights, uh, equal rights, and then as they become more skilled as actors of change, they help actually democratization of their, of their societies. So this is reinforcing. And Zahira Kamal, uh, the Palestinian um, activist, who was the first uh, female leader of a political party in Palestine, expressed that very well. Personal and national liberation go hand in hand. We will fail both women and our cause if we do not understand that liberating women from discrimination will better equip them for waging a successful national struggle. And the case of Palestine is really uh, um, very important. This quote, by the way, is in Mary's book, A Quiet Revolution, the first Palestinian intifada and nonviolent resistance. Uh, and I really recommend this book to anyone who really wants to understand better um, what's happening in Palestine. But here is um, the 1970s and 1980s in Palestine, uh, in absence of their own government, uh, there was a growing um, network of women who, who organized many um, uh, informal organizations that was taking, were taking care of health and education and informal governance, basically, for the whole of uh, Palestinian society. So they, they actually created almost uh, a parallel uh, uh, civil society, a, a real so civil society where there were community leaders. And this helped tremendously when the first intifada broke out in 1987. 
So here the women were really mu very much empowered and they were very much a part of the first intifada. Um, what happened next is that when um, the leadership of the PLO came uh, after signing the Oslo Accords in 1993, they came into power, created the Palestinian Authority. They basically told the women, thank you very much, but now you can go home. Sure. Which happens in many, many situations. Many situations where women have been the key actors of change, but then they do not get the benefit. They, they, yeah, they cannot concretize, they cannot um, capitalize on those gains. And then everything is lost. And a lot has been lost uh, in the next phase for the women of Palestine. And actually, if you look at 15 years later, the second intifada, they were not at all involved. And, as a re and also, it was a very violent insurrection. We are not talking about non-violence anymore. I would like to say that in the case of the um, uh, Arab uh, Spring, or we say Arab Awakening rather than Spring, because it's, uh, <laughs> it has turned into winter. We don't know exactly which season we are at at this point. Uh, but five years later, what we can say is that there is one country that is a success story, and it's Tunisia. The constitution in 2014 was very much, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, so a very um, a, a, a constitution that is the most democratic of all the constitutions in the Arab world at this point, and we can really um, credit the women for this result because they did not let go. They they mobilized constantly, even when the uh, Islamist uh, party was elected at the election uh, elections in 2011. They made sure they protested. They they organized that so that the constitution, whatever constitution would be there, would continue and would, uh, would keep, would protect the women's rights and, and even um, extend them. So, um, because we, I have not much time, but I want to uh, also mention a few cases in African countries, because there are many uh, friends here from Africa. Uh, women movement are extremely strong in uh, all the African countries. They, they um, work at empowering women at the same time as they work against uh, political corruption. Uh, somebody asked the question earlier about the poorest of the poor and what to do uh, in those cases. And here, Wangari Matai really worked with the poorest of the poor and she worked at, susta at sustainable livelihood for these women so that they could plant trees and get um, the fruit of their labor literally. Uh, so this is really one very important point that a lot of these women movement are doing. And uh, another example is uh, Women of Zimbabwe Arise. Um, Jenny Williams was here in 2013. She's uh, one of the laureate of the James Lawson Award. And she was explaining how her, her struggle against the Mugabe's regime and also for the empowerment of women in Zimbabwe. So I, sorry. Yeah, Mike. Um, so I mentioned on the first night the great exchange of African-American leaders traveling from the United States to India to try to learn the methods being used on the subcontinent. I just want to remind you of that because uh, knowledge is so important to the use of civil resistance. Now, it also is the case that Indians came to the United States. And one of the places that they came was to Highlander Folk School in Tennessee, which was a training place for labor organizers. And it was one of the few places in the South where white people and black people could meet together. They trained labor organizers in the techniques of civil resistance. And they were hearing from Indians. All across the South, you could see billboards talking about Martin Luther King at a communist training school. This photograph is actually taken at the Highlander Folk School. And does anybody recognize another face in the group? <laughs> Louder? <laughs> Jim? Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. So India, they may have been hearing from an Indian visitor at that point. Now, these are the three women who were behind the Montgomery bus boycott. Sharon mentioned this morning that people think that Rosa Parks had tired feet. 
and they don't understand the depth of preparation. A woman named Virginia Foster Durr is the person who raised the money to send Rosa Parks to Highlander Folk School. And she was married to the only white lawyer in Montgomery who would practice law with a black lawyer. Joanne Robinson was a college instructor who led the Black Women's Political Caucus in Montgomery. And for three years, that group had been talking about a citywide action against a segregated system. Once Rosa Parks was actually in jail, Joanne Robinson quietly and secretly went to the college uh, mimeograph machine and mimeographed 37,000 flyers on one of these huge drums. Your hands would stink for a week and then got them out to all of the schools and so that the pastors could um, announce on Monday. I don't have very good pictures of Joanne Robinson. She worked very hard to elude interruption. We don't have a very good photographic record for her. But she is the real hero of the Montgomery bus boycott's origin. Now this is the actual bust of Rosa Parks Road. And what you need to remember is that she had to go in through the front door, pay the money, and then get off the bus and walk to the back door <coughs> and climb on and get into one of the empty seats at the back or one of the seats in the back. If they were all filled, an African American had to stand even if the seats in the middle section between the two doors had empty seats. Rosa Parks did not have tired feet. On that particular day, she waited for an empty bus. She wanted to be able to sit in one of the empty middle seats. The Montgomery bus boycott was transformative for the civil rights movement. As Jim has explained to me, it was considered in the black community to be the most important event since the Civil War and the Emancip <coughs> Emancipation Proclamation. And the movement, uh, the voice of the movement <coughs> begins to spread. Martin Luther King emerges on the national stage. I like this picture because you might never have heard of him had, you, had Rosa Parks not done what she had done. But he plays a very critical role at this time in persuading the black community of the effectiveness of nonviolent methods. The Montgomery bus boycott's success was very, very heavily reliant on women because there were so many domestic workers who had to get bus rides. And now they were walking or riding mules in order to get to their day jobs. Although there are lots of funny stories that have emerged since of white women going and fetching their black maids in order to make sure that they got to work. So they were helping them to get to their houses to work. Uh, about uh, two-thirds of the 50,000 who participated in that boycott were women. On December 17, 1956, the Supreme Court made a landmark ruling, ruling the unconstitutionality of segregation. Another figure was Septima Ponsett Clark, who ran a citizenship program, first affiliated with Highlander Folk School, and later affiliated with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was the organization of which Dr. King was president. Septima believed that knowledge could be more empowering for the marginalized than formal legal equality. And part of this is because she was also, and her colleagues, working on literacy. As an antecedent, a preparation for voter registration drives, people had to be able to read and write. Uh, she talked about the fact that it was very, very difficult in the 1950s and 1960s as women began to make strides for someone who was black because uh, she had two problems. She was female and she was black. We have had some talk about the Southern student uh, sit-in campaign, and this is a picture of the four men in Greensboro. Daniel, where are you? Um, they didn't know what to call it and they sit down at the counter and you ask, how did this spread? Uh, what was the planning that went into that? There was no plan. 
it just spread like wildfire. So that, as I mentioned on the first night, by the end of two months it had spread to 75 cities. And by the end of the year it would spread to 100 cities. So this is the second most transformative event of the civil rights movement. Now here's what I want you to know. I don't recognize what I hear about the U.S. civil rights movement very much. It seems very foreign to the four years that I spent in it. And what you need to remember is the two most important and significant events. One was organized by women, the other was organized by young people. So when Black Lives Matter says, this is not your grandfather's civil rights movement, I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> we know about Na Diane Nash and the spread of the sit-ins. So age 22, I make my way to Atlanta to work with Professor Howard Zinn and Ella Baker. I will say more about her in just a moment. Um, this book, Freedom Song, is a book about my four years working for the movement. And for any of you who want to know more, it's out of print, but it's available from secondhand uh, sources and Amazon, that sort of thing. Uh, at age 23, I spent Christmas in jail in Atlanta, in the Atlanta City Jail called Bl Black Big Rock. A Kenyan diplomat named Oginga Odinga wanted to meet with people from the civil rights movement. The State Department would not let him travel by car because, of course, he would be very vulnerable driving through the South. They forced him to fly. We went to meet with him. Two of our members went to get a cup of coffee, were not served. Normally, because I was working in communications, I was not supposed to go to jail. But how could I leave all of my fellow <laughs> workers sitting in the cafe trying to get two cups of coffee and not join them? So I did, and I spent Christmas in jail. This is a picture from a mass meeting in Danville, Virginia. And mass meetings were where all of the discussions went on. It was training. It was preparation. It was also strategy. It was where people made the binding decision to take on the dangers of whatever the program or the plans were for the next few days. I also want to mention, however, because there's a lot of naivete about this also, I lived in the part of the black community where there was a single lane across a narrow ravine high above the Dan River, which was the only way into that part of town. The police never followed us in to that section of town. Can anybody guess why? Achia. Take a stab. Were afraid? Because the place was filled with guns. We have a right in the United States that's been interpreted by the Supreme Court as affecting individuals carrying arms, even though the actual amendment talks about militias. Um, I also wrote in my book that there was no conflict felt by a black Southerner who professed nonviolence but also believed in self-defense. I think this is really important. You do not need to believe in nonviolent action in order to be an effective participant in it. You need to understand it. You need to be able to participate in the process of making the plans that you will adhere to. And you need to be able to adhere to nonviolent discipline. So this was where we trained for everything, fire hoses, water water hoses, uh, police dogs, planning strategy. One of the things we learned was always carry a toothbrush because you never know where you're, when you're going to go to jail. Another thing I want to correct is we, those of us who were there because of the local people, all of us who came from outside, were protected by the black community. And they all had guns. Of course, they left them at home when they went to movement meetings. Now, coming back to Ella Baker, this is one of the great voices of social history in the United States, but consistent with what Anne-Marie has presented, very much overlooked. She talked about often with me the fact that the number of women who had carried the movement was much larger 
than the number of men who were carrying the movement. And this was based on deep experience. She also had a perception that leadership might come from anyone. Therefore, our job as organizers was to identify that talent and then try to strengthen it, help it mature, help it grow, not to seek a glamorous role at front. Many people think of the civil rights movement as a lot of marches and demonstrations and so on. This is how I think of the civil rights movement. Endless meetings. Because that's what it takes to arrive at agreement, to make the plans, to do the preparation, to do the planning. And I would just recommend to you that when critics of nonviolent action say, oh yes, violence is fast, but nonviolence is is, is slow. Um, this is a rather bizarre statement, originating, originating at least with Aristotle, but possibly before then. There has been a millennial conversation about the connection between the means and the ends. How you fight affects the outcomes. And therefore, that's another reason for the endless meetings. You can't make those decisions quickly. My job was in communications, getting out the news. Also for us, the only safety measure we sometimes had was to get a reporter to a jail inquiring about our fellow workers who were there. I was sent to Mississippi in 1964 to work on the Mississippi Freedom Summer, which was to be a massive assault on the most segregated state in the country, also the most backward state. Uh, the word impunity was mentioned on the first day. Who mentioned impunity? Raise your hand if you remember saying that word. Yes, okay, <laughs> define it for us. Well, it's a situation when somebody does not get punished for what they did, and it's usually yeah. for my country a person who represents this state. Absolutely, so there was phenomenal random violence, there was no accountability for it, and much of it was conducted by lawmen. And we later found out through journalists' work that approximately half of the members of the Ku Klux Klan on the right were law officers. You can quickly see that very few black people were able to vote in Mississippi. This is the, this is the executive secretary of SNCC. And um, we determined that the most value for our work would be on voter registration and on political participation. That these were the engines that would drive long-term significant strategic change for Mississippi. Miss Baker was extremely influential with Bob Moses on the left who ran the Mississippi program for SNCC and Dave Dennis on the right who ran the program for the Congress of Racial Equality. She was extremely persuasive in her analysis of the role that women had played in what social change had taken place in the U.S. South and they were very much influenced by her. We formed an umbrella the Council of Federated Organizations to blend all of the organizational identities. So there was no fighting or competition out front for money. The money went to COFO. We were in 82 counties, many, many alternative and parallel institutions derived from Gandhi's constructive program. Here I am in the middle of the cheerfully chaotic Council of Federations <laughs> office on the phone. That was my job, working with reporters. I was always on the phone trying to get reporters to a jail or trying to get them to cover a particular story. Um, this is just recently I went back. These are some of the organizers from Freedom Side. And somebody had put that picture I just showed you on the wall of the building that we used to be in. And they, they lined me up and put me in front of the thing to take a picture. I just thought you'd get a kick out of that. Anyway, we organized 38 freedom schools, 3,000 students, 200 teachers. And what we were doing was, as Mache has given us this magnificent book on reclaiming history from national liberation struggles, 
we were reclaiming history because you can imagine the, the, you can imagine the accounts of U.S. history that the black children of Mississippi were taught. You can just imagine them and it'll make you feel sick. 60,000 local people were directly engaged, but, and many so social scientists have since corroborated this, women were the backbone of the organizing. Very, very effective at going door to door, persuading people to overcome their fear and attend meetings. Voter registration has been effective over the years. I will just report to you in one sentence, Mississippi has more elected black officials today than any other state in the union. And whole swaths of counties have almost entirely black sheriffs and sheriff's deputies who are elected and getting reelected, including in mixed populations. On the first day of the Mississippi Freedom Summer, three of my fellow workers disappeared. Andrew Goodman, it, in the middle, James Cheney and Mickey Schwerner. And it fell to me to phone the families and tell them that we suspected foul play. Now, SNCC in Mississippi saw women as able and worthy organizers. The three women on the left are organizers for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Since black people couldn't participate in the all-white party, we created an alternative political party. And, um, we would eventually take a convention challenge to the National Democratic Party. I include the picture on the right because we had a mock ballot in 1963 just to prove that Mississippi blacks wanted to vote because all of the white officials said, oh, our niggers don't want to vote. They're happy with the way that everything is. We decided we would prove that that was not true and more than 60,000 people for the first time voted and it didn't even count. And I've looked in vain for years for a picture that shows the fear that existed that was palpable in those communities and I finally found one. So the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party um, had many women leaders and characteristically in local movements of nonviolent resistance, there's a lessening of dependency on leaders. So we had a proliferation of leadership. This is Fannie Lou Hamer, who walked with a limp and was a plantation worker. She and her family were thrown off the plantation for trying to register to vote. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party went to the National Party in 1964 and had a convention challenge. Lyndon Johnson tried to keep her from speaking, President Lyndon Johnson and moved her to an off spot. But in the end, something like 80 million people saw her. It was massively effective. Helped to push through the, the Civil Rights Act. When offered a compromise of two seats to sit in the Democratic regular all-white party, Fannie Lou Hamer was the spokesperson who said, we have already had a convention and we elected our own 68 delegates and no, we're not going to accept two seats. Here is a photograph of the three women. There are five congressional districts in Mississippi and we would organize a congressional challenge to challenge the seating of the all-white party in January 65. And of the five congressional districts, Three of them were represented by women. I believe there was no place else in the United States where out of five seats like that on a representational basis, three of them would have been given to women. Here they are again. The Selma to Montgomery, Alabama march resulted in the Voting Rights Act, which is now trying to be dismantled by the um, far right. It w its passage was largely a result of the events of the Freedom Summer. Um, we've talked about bad weather showing commitment. This is a picture of the Selma March you don't normally see, but there were days like this. This is for a giggle. Um, I'm there on the right and my fellow workers, and we are holding a sit-in 
at the office of Jim Foreman, who was our executive secretary. I have, don't have a clue of what the issue was any longer. I can't remember. One sign says, no more work till justice is done. The other says, unfair. But we had a lot of fun. A, for, a fellow worker, Casey Hayden and I, wrote a paper in 1965, published by the War Resisters League in 1966, called Sex and Caste. And we sent it to 40 women across the United States who were working in the peace and freedom movements. And as a result, consciousness raising groups began spiraling and taking place. And eventually from that would result the women's liberation movement as a moment in an ongoing um, movement. By 1970, there was a national U.S. women's strike, and it was everywhere, every single town. Here's where I'm ending. You recognize the names. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner. My fellow workers who were killed by law officers. We found their bodies in August 1964. It took a couple, three years for justice to be done. They were killed by elected officers of the law. Today, the field office for the Federal Bureau of Investigation for Jackson has its building named after them. And the thought that I will leave with you is that had anyone been using armed struggle in Mississippi, there would never have been an outcome like this or all of the other positive developments. Thank you. Okay, um, can you guys hear me okay? Everyone hear me? Okay. So um, I'm gonna take this conversation, um, basically I'm gonna take it from where Marion and Anne Marie have left off and I'm gonna use um, a little bit of the, the theory and um, apply it to the practice of civil resistance coming from the field of gender studies. Um, so I'm going to uh, take what we might call a gender analysis and apply some of those tools to the field of civil resistance. Um, before I get started, can I just get a show of hands of how many people um, have conducted a gender analysis or have used it in some way or another in their work? Show of hands. So a few people, great. Well, you all can help me then as I um, try and build an intersection really between the field of um, gender and gender analysis and civil resistance. Let me just turn this off. Okay. Um, and I'm going to use a couple different examples to illustrate um, how gender analysis intersects with civil resistance. Um, primarily, I'm going to use uh, research that I did as a student here at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy with some of my classmates, um, and that's uh, looking at the case of Egypt and the January 25th movement, um, but I'll use a couple different examples as well. Um, just to get started, I want to acknowledge that, you know, in the room we probably have a lot of varying levels of understanding about what is gender, um, how do we understand gender, and, and what is a gender analysis. So I'm going to go through a few concepts first, um, and then I'm going to apply those ideas to civil resistance. Um, so the first idea I just want to share with you all about gender um, is that when I talk about gender, I'm not talking about the biological differences between men and women um, or the <laughs> construct of, of gender as sort of as sex, um, but rather I'm looking at um, how gender is socially constructed and how it is socially contextual um, and it varies based on the context that we're in. Um, and to get a sense of what I'm talking about, you can just think of any time that you've maybe been to a place that's really different from your own home country or home community. Um, and, and maybe, you know, you can see when you show up um, how gender norms are really kind of different. Um, maybe uh, the way that men and women dress is different or um, who you're allowed to interact with or where you're able to be at certain times of the day or night um, can vary and um, perhaps some of you experience that even coming here to the Summer Institute. Um, the second concept I want to highlight is that gender is really about asymmetric power relations. Um, and so it's looking at how um, these power relations are unequal, um, and it's really about how power functions in society based on um, our gender identities. So just like colonialism, caste systems, and um, slavery are all systems of power and repression, so too are patriarchy and sexism. 
Um, so in this sense, you know, we can see the history of how some historically males are more worthy than others um, and often those identified as females. So that's the history and, and some of that has been illuminated in, in the presentations thus far. So because gender is about power, it's also inherently political. Um, it affects our access to positions of power. Um, it affects our access to materials and cultural resources. Um, it affects the, the access that we have to specific spaces, the spaces that we can inhabit, um, the authority and legitimacy that we, can, that we can yield. And thus it shapes what we would call the sources of power that we hold. Um, however, this doesn't mean that all men are more powerful than women. Um, you know, gender intersects with a lot of other identities that we hold, including race and class, ethnicity, religion, age, geographic location, and, and other identities. The third concept I just want to highlight really quickly is that um, gender and gender identity, which is how one identifies, um, it's not monolithic, it's very fluid. So women do not all behave the same way or think the same way, and likewise men do not all behave or think in the same ways, right? Um, and, and lastly, that gender is really performed, um, and it's performed differently depending on the context. Um, some scholars refer to this as doing gender. Um, so our social interactions and behaviors contribute to upholding these gender norms or defying them um, and upholding these structures of gender. And finally, I just want to say that gender is not a code word for women. Um, there is a deep analysis of masculinities that can and should be applied to the field of civil resistance. Um, for today, however, we're really focusing on uncovering that history of women and civil resistance and analyzing from a gendered perspective um, women's experiences in movements. So to illustrate some of these concepts, I'm going to explain what these images are um, on the screen. Um, in April 2016, uh, an Iranian court forced a male convict to wear traditional Kurdish women's clothes in public, perceiving it as a humiliating and degrading punishment. And I want to thank Anne-Marie for sharing the example, who we got from our colleague uh, Shaska Byerly. Um, and this example, I think, demonstrates in, in some ways the, the social and cultural devaluation of Kurdish women in the Iranian context. Um, but it also shows uh, how power and gender norms um, and gender shaming are so powerful uh, in this particular context. So in response, um, Kurdish men protested this misogynistic gender shaming sort of uh, decision by the court by dressing in Kurdish women clothing themselves taking photos of themselves and posting it on social media. And this act was really aimed at challenging the legitimacy of the decision and of the, of the sanction um, and trying to reduce the shame associated with that. So how is gender analysis relevant to the field of civil resistance? Um, First of all, I want to argue that because gender analysis is a form of power analysis, um, because it looks at how a variety of issues or problems or injustices affect people differently because of their socially constructed um, gender identities, um, by looking at this um, and how some people are granted more or less power based on gendered identities as well as others, as I mentioned, we can really start to reveal the layers um, of these power dynamics in, in, in the relationships and in our society. Um, so therefore, a gender analysis can really provide a, a little bit more of a complex understanding of the both the injustices and how they're experienced in society, as well as the power relations and, and how we might shift those power relations. Um, so I'm going to argue today that gender analysis is important to civil resistance because gender justice is really essential component of um, achieving other forms of justice and liberation. Um, and then also that if we infuse civil resistance with this gender analysis, both as an academic field of study, within the organizations that we work in, as well as the movements um, that are using civil resistance, that we really have the potential of making the field more inclusive, more strategic, and ultimately more effective. Um, I'm not going to talk about these two examples too much, but um, one of the ways I want to start to talk about how we can apply gender analysis to civil resistance is by applying it to some of the topics of some of our other presentations this week. Um, so we, we heard a little bit about how campaigns emerge yesterday in some of the presentations. Um, and we know that the factors involved in the emergence of movements are very complex. 
Um, but one of the reasons um, that grievances, excuse me, one of the reasons that movements do emerge is based on the grievances that people experience. Um, so how are grievances something that are gendered? Um, well, we can see from Anne Marie's presentation that, um, an, that the, the movements that emerged for women's rights came out of women's experiences in society and sometimes in movements. Um, and that these were really based on their specific experiences as women in society. Uh, and uh, several of the examples that Mary shared, both the Montgomery bus boycott as well as the lunch counter sit-in, and this is something that Reverend Lawson alluded to in the opening dinner as well, um, were really pushed by women because of the grievances that they had with experience, experiencing that form of segregation and injustice on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so those grievances that were experienced by women and also by men, um, perhaps, but perhaps be but perhaps experienced by women a little bit more because of certain divisions of labor or certain spaces that women inhabit more than men um, really push that as a central organizing um, uh, issue. So um, shifting from, from movement emergence to movement organizing and mobilization and recruitment. From gender studies, we know that um, and gender analysis, we know that men historically have tended to have more access to public spaces and political spheres, and women have, been tended, have tended to be relegated into more private spheres. Um, so even when women have access to political spheres, uh, they tend to operate with less power than their male counterparts. And um, another way of looking at sort of how women and men inhabit spaces differently is to think about formal and informal structures. Um, so in movements, men have tended to be a part of some of the more formal structures of movements, um, whereas women have tended to have access to and legitimacy within some of the more informal networks and, and social networks. So women have been cited to be more likely to join nonviolent movements and political actions um, through their community and neighborhood groups or through kinship networks. Um, and this really illustrates, I think, what's important about gender analysis for civil resistance, that um, the particular sites and locations um, and spheres in society that women uh, and men are located in um, really impact sort of the, the interactions that we have, the communication that we have with people, who we interact with, and therefore intera uh, impact how we're able to join movements as well. So it creates what some people call um, different organizing spaces or mobilization paths through which uh, people join. So let's um, look at this in the context of the January 25th movement in Egypt. So in the case of Egypt, um, a little bit of context just to set up uh, the analysis as well. Um, women's experiences in public spaces are really colored by the extremely high prevalence of sexual harassment, assault, and groping in public spaces. In 2011, a study reported that 83% of women had experienced some form of sexual harassment or assault in public spaces. A more recent study uh, concluded that 99.3% of women have experienced this, and that 63% of men admitted having perpetuated this kind of harassment, half of whom uh, blamed women and, and blamed them for provoking that harassment. Furthermore, the protest space was something that has always been considered a masculine space in the Egypt context. Um, and women who participated in protests in Egypt, uh, nevertheless, were also specifically targeted by police as women. Um, so women reported having their clothing ripped off or their veils removed. Um, and these were attempts by the security forces to really shame them in public spaces and discourage them from participating in the movements. Um, so these are really important factors to consider and to analyze in your context um, in, in terms of considering how women can um, participate. And um, in the context of Egypt, uh, these were important factors that women and men considered as they were organizing. So one of the ways that men and women organized and lead up to the January 25th protest was using internet-based social media platforms. Um, oftentimes online communication and information sharing is something that's touted as really being a democratic or gender neutral space uh, where everybody's 
socioeconomic status and gender identities are sort of uh, exist on some kind of level playing field. Um, but in fact, there's a lot of ways in which uh, women do gain access to new forms of power because of their access to the internet. Um, but actually, a lot of the research that we found too says that um, the same kind of experiences and gender norms and hierarchies that we experience in society also happen online. Um, but nevertheless, in the, ca in the case of Egypt, women did uh, report that the internet did provide a safe space for them to publicly um, share their political views and, and to organize. And this online space did segue into their offline participation in the square as well. So I want to stress that um, you know, these findings are very highly contextual to the, to the specific case. Um, and they're, they're no w in no way supposed to be prescriptive. So you don't need to use online spaces to organize women, and um, online organizing may or may not be something that's, that's necessary in your context. Um, but another way that the, uh, that the organizers prepared for and planned for women's involvement um, was through um, ca careful preparation. And this is an image um, from a page in a manual that was created and distributed online in advance of the January 25th protests. It includes strategic directions for what to wear and what to bring to the protests. Um, and, and some of the suggestions include things such as how to wear your headscarf or to wear two of them. Um, and so these were ways of addressing some of these um, issues and experiences that women had faced in joining protests. Um, and so by strategically planning in advance for the assaults that were designed really to target women and terrify them and discourage their participation, uh, women were able to say, you know, we're not going to let you keep us away from joining. Another way that uh, the movement mobilization was gendered in the case of Egypt was through the gendered rhetoric that was used um, in the lead up and in and, um, and, and, and both by the movement and by the state, as we'll see. So this is a picture of Asma Mahfouz, who's a co-founder of the April 6th movement. Um, she's been called the bravest girl in Egypt. Um, she created a video calling on Egyptian citizens um, to join her in Takrir Square on January 25th. And she published this video online. So in this video, which many people say was a part of sparking the January 25th revolution, she plays on these existing notions of gender roles in Egyptian society. Uh, her language is explicitly gendered as she calls on the masculinity and honor and dignity of Egyptian men, urging them to come to Takrir Square to play the role of both protester and protector. So while her words portray women as vulnerable in the face of these all-male security forces and in the need of protection, she simultaneously is asserting her lack of fear and exploiting these gender stereotypes in order to catalyze the movement and mobilize people to join. So um, on the side of the regime and on the side of the state, they also use gendered rhetoric to try and uh, stimulate the loyalty of, of Egyptian citizens. So for a little bit of context as well, in Egypt, and this is not unique to Egypt either, the nation of Egypt is considered um, and imagined to be something that's a woman. Um, so the word for Egypt in Arabic is gendered female. Um, Egypt is often referred to as the mother of the world. And the nation, which is associated with concepts of fertility and morality and honor, all of which are associated with sort of the female domain. So in his final presidential speech to the nation, um, the then, uh, then President Mubarak referred to himself as the father of the nation and the father of Egyptian citizens. He, um, he called on his sons and daughters and, um, and used sort of like a stern voice as a, as a father. And he appealed to them and to their loyalty um, and their loyalty to the family, in this case the Egyptian state, as a means of inspiring their obedience and their loyalty um, and to discourage people again from participating in the movement. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how gender, uh, excuse me, how participation is also gendered. Um, participation is closely tied to the organizing and mobilization and recruitment. Um, and uh, what we know from obviously the research from Erica and, and Maria is that um, the success of nonviolent movements is, is dependent on the active participation of people. And the more widespread and diverse this participation is, um, the more likely that the movement is able to shift people and individuals within the pillars of support to maintain the status quo, that maintain the status quo. 
So in the sense we know that um, it's important, if not essential, that movements engage the active participation of women who make up 50% of the population. Um, but we must caution against the instrumentalization of women's participation. So women's participation is not merely a way of increasing people power um, or increasing the numbers or bodies in a movement. So um, it's not enough to say, you know, women make up 50% of the protest. Um, we really have to look deeper at how women are participating, uh, what roles are they taking on, how do they feel within movement spaces. So in some cases, movements have provided spaces for women to defy um, the, the, the gender norms in their society. Um, they've created opportunities for women's liberation, for women's leadership. But in other cases, movements have actually been a force um, for reinforcing gender differences and, and replicating these hierarchies from society within the movements. So some women have reported feeling marginalized within movement spaces, reduced to gender normative positions such as um, caretakers or secretaries, even cleaning or cooking for the movement. Um, and really, I just want to reiterate that movements that are seeking democratic change or national liberation, justice and equality, and other inherently egalitarian aims really ought to exemplify and embody these visions within their movements. Returning to the case of Egypt, um, this really uh, women really saw the space as some as a space where they were for the first time in many of their lives um, in a space that they felt like was equal to men. So women took on numerous roles within the movement. Um, they contributed as organizers in the lead up to the movement. They were a part of leading protests on the front line. They were in the square organizing supplies, conducting identity checks, reporting, blogging, etc. And the figures ranged um, in terms of what they quoted as female participation. It ranged from about 20% to 50%. Um, and, and this was in a context where women rarely would have made even 10% of the, of the makeup of a protest. Um, so it was under what, what people felt like were a unifying goal of getting Mubarak out, that no singular group's agenda was really the focus. Um, and women felt that they could come out into the streets not just as women, but also as citizens, full citizens of Egypt. And this really broke these traditional barriers of the protest space as masculine. Um, in some cases, you can see um, women's roles were very strategic. So one of the images is of women conducting identity checks at the entrance of the space to Tahrir Square. Um, and this was because women would have been able to pat down other women, but if men had been in that role, they wouldn't have been able to pat down a woman and let her into the square. Um, and it's important, I think, to mention uh, that the square was actually not really an open space, so to speak. It was, it was cordoned off. There were um, barriers put into place so that the space inside side was actually protected, and this was done for many reasons. Um, thank you. Uh, this was done for many reasons, uh, some of which were uh, in order to maintain a sort of nonviolent discipline and to keep infiltrators out, um, but it was also about creating a safe space within the square. Um, and one thing that Mary has shared with me as well is that within the square there was actually a code by males, a non-harassment code. Um, so many people call Tahrir Square a utopian square or a space where gender doesn't, didn't feel like an issue. Um, women felt like equal citizens alongside men. And um, one young woman was quoted as saying that in the first time in years, she was not objectified as a sexual object, but she was able to be in the street without the danger of harassment. I'm going to skip through a couple of slides and, and actually just... Um, Actually, not before I uh, credit Roger, thank you for sharing this image of um, women in Burkina Faso who are wielding spatulas. Um, and this is something that I think is really important about analyzing sort of gender and civil resistance. This is a symbolic, um, uh, the spatulas are a symbolic tool, and I'm just going to read from the words that you shared online in the orientation. The spatula takes on a strong symbol for women in Burkina Faso. It's used as women as a last weapon to curse a person against these misdeeds or behaviors. So when women use spatulas, it's a serious curse to the person for whom the action was taken. Women therefore wanted um, wanted to show the action and their determination to contribute to bringing down the former president and his regime, but doing it peacefully. 
Um, and so we can see how symbols of gendered spaces, such as the kitchen, are used in protest, and they're used in ways that have symbolic meaning in society as well. And I'm just going to skip to my last slide because I know we're running out of time. This is a list of some of the key takeaways that I think we can think about when we think about analyzing space, um, analyzing structures, analyzing where men and women exist, where, what they have access to, um, and things to really think about and consider um, as civil resistance movement leaders and um, people engaged in, in, in activities related to civil resistance. 